So without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Sharon Moser, who is Dean of the Jackson School of Geosciences at the University of Texas at Austin. And she is our presenter for today. So Sharon, it's all yours. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. And thank you for coming. I really uh, appreciate your interest in the subject. Uh, what I want to present today are results of a project that we have been working on that's been sponsored by the National Science Foundation looking at the future of undergraduate geoscience education. And what I want to do today is really focus on the information we've been getting uh, from uh, geoscience employers and the impact of basically the geoscience workforce both today and in the future on uh, the future of undergraduate education. Uh, next. And first, just sort of an overview of what the project has been. In 2014, we had a summit where we had about 200 educators, and they were people from you know major research universities that had large or had undergraduate programs, four-year and two-year colleges. And it was a mixture of heads and chairs and faculty and people doing education research. And we had a small number of people uh, from the employment industries and government. Uh, it was really the first step in a high level, developing a high level community vision for the geosciences. And I think that one of the things that came out of the summit was there was a surprising agreement collectively on what really needed to be done and what kinds of things uh, undergraduates needed to learn. In the meantime, we have had an ongoing community survey and if you haven't taken it, it's still online. Uh, we've had well over 455 respondents, of which the majority are academics. 78% uh, in fact are academics, 17% uh, are industry, and 3% government. Um, but that is really 76 people and 13 people from government, mainly from state surveys. And an important point is that 85% of those did not come to the of any of the people uh, did not come to the summit. So between the survey and the outcomes of the summit itself, we've got you know close to 500 people who uh, have participated and given their input. Uh, we then did a, a, a workshop in May, this May of this year for geoscience employers. We had 46 participants, and we had a nice spread between people from the industry. Uh, sorry. Uh, energy industry, uh, hydrology, engineering, and environmental consulting firms, uh, government agencies, sort of across the board, everything from USGS to NASA to NOAA to USDA and so on. And um, one person from mining and a very small number of academics because we were really wanting to focus on the employers themselves. And our next step actually is a summit for heads and chairs, which will be held again in Austin in January, and I'll say more about that uh, later on. Next. So I think the first thing I should do is give sort of a very brief overview as to why the geoscience workforce today and the future has an impact on undergraduate uh, education. And we get this both from the summit itself, uh, from the survey, and also from uh, strongly from focus groups and from this geoscience educators, uh, sorry, geoscience uh, workforce uh, summit or the workshop we had. And one of the things that industry points out very strongly is that students now need to be able to work interdisciplinary and use different disciplines, that the work that they're going to do uh, involves multidisciplinary approaches to problems, they're going to have to integrate different types of data sets and work in cross-disciplinary teams. They also say that the whole paradigm has changed, that people really do in working think about rocks in fundamentally different ways and that the types of jobs that geoscientists do has really expanded and changed. Of course, there's been huge technological advances which requires changing skill sets. Students need to be more capable of doing modeling and working digitally. And on the flip side, however, uh, industry representatives are very concerned that students have this black box mentality. Uh, 
they use software and they use programs and they don't really understand how it works and that that is something that really uh, is detrimental uh, to them when they get out. Uh, big data, uh, they are dealing with large amounts of data and so they need to know how to do statistical analyses, how to manage, use, and model this. And also there's the other aspect, there's a lot more interaction between business and society. So they need to understand economics and something about law and business practices and particularly ethics and risk management and the environment itself. And there's a huge cultural diversity that they are going to have to deal with both people within the United States but also people globally. And so as the workforce changes, we need to prepare our students for that. Next. So one of the major conclusions that came out of the summit was that developing competency skills and conceptual understandings was more important than taking specific courses. If we tried to get people to talk about courses, everybody wants to argue about the courses, but people tended to agree on concepts and skills that students needed. The survey itself shows, and this is a graph from the survey, uh, blue is yes and red is no, that overwhelmingly that was agreed with all the people who took the survey regardless of what uh, their type of uh, employment was. Next. So this one thing the survey, did, one thing the summit did was it uh, came up with a series of concepts that uh, they felt were needed for undergraduate education and then the survey uh, ask what people thought about this and what you're seeing here is the results of the survey for these different concepts that were listed and blue is uh, very important, red is important, green is neutral and, and so on. And you can see that the majority of people thought all of these concepts were important obviously to varying degrees and they are such things as Earth as a complex dynamic system with linkages between systems, you know, deep time, climate change, natural resources, surface processes, and then Earth materials, Earth structure, natural hazards, and hydrology. And then there was, in several of these, there were other things uh, indicated. So what we did at the workshop for employers was we didn't show them this data first. First we asked them what they thought, and then we uh, and got their feedback and then we um, at showed them the data and got their feedback on that. And so next, this is what came out of our asking the employers workshop uh, people you know, what they thought in terms of concepts that people knew and needed to know and they thought very definitely that students needed a systems thinking they under, needed to understand how systems work and interact, and those systems are the ones that we're used to thinking of for the most part, atmosphere, hydrosphere, lithosphere, but they had pedosphere and surface uh, broken out, uh, biosphere, and then also solar earth interactions and human societal uh, coupling and impact on the earth, uh, both the influence of geology on society, but society on earth processes. Next. They also thought students really needed to understand processes, uh, geochemical cycles, uh, thermodynamics, and there was a lot of discussion about that, energy, kinetics, diffusion, heat, mass transfer, fluid flow, those were things that they felt were all of those things really critical. And then the rest of these that I have listed here are ones that they came up with and they're, I, I would say they're more standard uh, geological processes that were used to thinking of that they felt were really important for students to know. Next. And then the uh, last of the sort of three sort of things, and what I've done is I've pulled together all the things that the different uh, working groups uh, had brought up, were tools, that there were certain tools students needed to know how to use. And the first three unquestionably are, are the top ones and the rest of them there are in no specific order. But one thing that came out very loud and clear that across the board the employers thought that students needed to understand uh, statistics, uncertainty, and probability. 
They needed to have high-level math, differential equations in linear algebra, and the field methods or you know, field experiences were extremely important. Next. They then went through each of the different uh, categories of concepts that the uh, summit had come up with and that we had asked about on the surveys and put their thoughts and granularity into what they thought these things meant. And I'm going to show you each one, but I'm not going to talk about each one. You'll have the slides. They're also available on the Summit website. Uh, but some of them, I, I thought it was important for you to see them. And certainly in terms of a complex system, the fact it was nonlinear, uh, understanding the complexity and interactions, size of the systems, feedbacks, implications of predictions, you know, work and things that affect the Earth systems, and also solar Earth system interaction. Next. Deep time, very definitely the kinds of things that, as an academic, we generally think about the sort of conventional uh, concepts of deep time, impact on processes, but also events and rates, and for students to be able to do temporal reasoning, thinking about time and what that actually means on the short scale as well as the intermediate and then, of course, geologic time scale. Next. Uh, climate change uh, was interestingly went into great detail, uh, really wanting them to understand climate change over geologic time, uh, different, you know, the time scales of it, local versus continental scale, use of proxy records, uh, driving mechanisms and causes of it, all the different kinds of things that needed to be looked at, uh, difference between weather and climate and then the impacts of climate change in terms of water resources, biosphere, soil, agriculture, and so on. Next. Natural resources, uh, a lot of detail on that in terms of really understanding what is a natural resource, uh, where it comes from, how it's used, uh, what's renewable and what's non-renewable, and then resource dependency and limits. Uh, understanding you know where it comes from, how it's used, uh, you know the supply and demand of it, and actually getting uh, ore and fossil fuels to market. Looking at the time and space scale of formation of these uh, resources, the depletion, how sustainable they were, uh, economics of it, and really how things were made, and that was both ore as well as sort of fossil fuels. Uh, or other material objects. Next. Surface processes, uh, these really sort of fell into two main groups. What we would tend to think of is dominantly sedimentology and then geomorphology, although they definitely were also talked a lot about the biological, chemical, and physical interactions that were taking place and both chemical and physical changes and the rates of those processes. And then also uh, those processes in terms of habitability and sustaining life and also natural hazards. Next. Earth materials is pretty much uh, what we would think, you know, what the physical and chemical properties of rocks and minerals are and then the processes by which they form. Next. Earth structure, again, pretty straightforward. You know, all the different things in terms of the structure of the Earth, uh, both what it is and how we know, deformation uh, and structures, plate tectonics. Uh, so fairly straightforward uh, ideas on what Earth structure actually means. Next. Hydrogeology, again, uh, water cycle, groundwater aqu aquifers, biochemistry and aqueous geochemistry, surface, subsurface water interactions, and then ec economics and public policy. Next. So the, in addition to looking at the um, concepts, they also looked at the skills. And so the summit 
uh, broke the skills into two sorts of parts, science skills that we expect most scientists or all scientists should be able to do, and then geoscience skills. And on the survey, we asked people again uh, what their view of these skills were, uh, and you're seeing a graph from the survey itself. One is blue, which is very important. Two is red, is, uh, is, is important. And three, of course, is neutral. And again, you can see that the majority of people thought that these skills for scientists were uh, important, and again, to varying degrees. And the obvious ones, critical thinking, problem solving, communicating effectively, ability to access and integrate information from different sources, continue to learn, understand use scientific research methods, strong quantitative skills and ability to apply, and the ability to work in interdisciplinary teams and across cultures. And I should say, when you look at the survey results for employers versus academics, there's very only a few cases is there much difference. They're pretty much the same across the board. Next. Uh, the summit, as I said, also came up with geoscience skills uh, that we felt made distinguished us from the rest of the scientists. And again, the survey uh, data is here. And as you can see, uh, in most uh, in fact, all of them, uh, the majority of people thought they were important or very important. Uh, there were some that were thought uh, definitely less so than others. Uh, but making inferences about the Earth system from observations of the natural world combined with experimental modeling, uh, readily solved problems, especially those requiring spatial and temporal or 3D and 4D interpretations, working with uncertainty, non-uniqueness, incompleteness, ambiguity, and indirect observations, uh, integrating data from other disciplines and apply system thinking, strong field skills, and a working knowledge of GIS. A number of people said that if we'd split that into two, uh, it would have been uh, one of the strongest in terms of being very important. Have strong computational skills, ability to manage and analyze large data sets, and being technologically versatile. Next. So once again, we at the employer's workshop, we asked them what they thought before we showed them the data from the survey. And we got uh, the idea of they thought that one of the critical skills or competencies was really being able to do geoscientific thinking. They needed to be able to think temporally and spatially. They need to think in terms of systems. They need to be able to do geologic reasoning and then do synthesis. And that they also needed to solve problems in the context of this complex nonlinear systems, things that were open and dynamic. Uh, they wanted them to be able to actually figure out and ask the appropriate questions to understand the context of the problem to solve problems in both 3D as well as including time, so 4D, uh, and really work on problems with no clear answers. They also stress the importance of managing uncertainty in problem solving and having a passion for solving problems. Some of them talked about it, it's like wanting to do puzzles. And also to work by analogy inference and with limits of certainty and be intellectually flexible, being able to apply skills in new scenarios. Next. They then took the list, and this is one group, but if you look at all the other groups, it sort of fits. They took the list of skills, and they said, OK, as an undergraduate, uh, some things people should be aware of basically have had it in a class, some things they should be proficient, in other words, they've had to actually use it in classes and apply it. Uh, mastery was the idea that they had done a project or a thesis or something that required they demonstrated the ability. E was expert, which they decided was a master's or a PhD level. And if you look at the list, they ended up agreeing that everybody should be proficient in all of these, and I've highlighted in red the ones that are the um, uh, 
science, the geoscientific ones, most of those they also thought that they should be proficient at. Next. And then they talked at great length about technical skills and then non-technical skills. In terms of technical skills, they really emphasized the need to solve problems with data, in fact, real data. Uh, they thought the students needed to learn how to collect data, interpret the data, use the data, apply the data. They needed to really start their project with the idea and understanding of how the data would answer the question and why they were collecting the data that they were collecting as opposed to collecting different data. And of course evaluating the data, how good the data was, understanding uncertainties and making predictions with limited data and so on. They also really emphasized quantitative and math skills much, much more than I was expecting at least and how important it was to integrate it into geoscience courses throughout the student's uh, career. The ac few academics that were there did stress the difficulties in that because most kids don't come in, you know, a lot of them don't come in ready to take calculus, let alone going into differential equations and linear algebra, but they very definitely thought particularly linear algebra was critically important and also differential equations, so that varied a little bit with employer uh, very, very strongly thought probability and statistics was necessary, and that's mainly so they could understand risk. Uh, they need to understand scale. And in terms of computer programming skills, they didn't necessarily all think that they needed to know how to program, but they thought they needed to know how to solve a problem computationally so that when they got an answer out of a black box, they would have some ideas, not only what was it did it work or was the answer uh, reasonable, but if it didn't seem reasonable, what sort of steps might have caused the problem? They also thought it was really critical for them to have a chance to do authentic research and collect new information as well as critically evaluate the literature and do critical thinking. Next. Uh, they were very strong on field experiences. Uh, both field camp in particular and field experiences, they felt that students get so much more out of that than just learning to, to map or analyze uh, field outcrops. It helps, they felt, with spatial cognition, creative problem solving, working with teams, and geologic synthesis. Uh, even though it didn't show up as strongly on the survey, this group felt GIS was really critical for building large data sets that the students did need to learn how to handle big data, visualize, use visualization and modeling tools, and they listed a number of them, integrate technical and quantitative skills, uh, know something about programming and application development, be technologically versatile. Basically, they weren't supposed to you know, be using black boxes. They needed to really understand how these things worked. And they needed to be prepared to continue to learn lifelong because technology and software and concepts and skills were going to change so much that they had to be able to adapt. Next. And then non-technical skills, they really got into this in great detail. Oral and written communication, yes, but also knowing your audience and being able to speak to the public as well as to a scientific audience. And they really stressed listening skills as being something that students really needed to learn to listen and pay attention to what they were hearing. In terms of project management, uh, very definitely wanted students to have experience doing teamwork. Uh, they thought everybody should have an experience being both a leader and a follower. Too often uh, people only do one. And that too often in teams, people tend to divide the work so people do what they're best at and they stressed that it was really important that didn't happen, that there was an iterative process amongst students with different backgrounds and disciplines. And even if that led to conflict, conflict was important because the answer might be in the somewhere in that conflict space so that students needed to do conflict resolution, uh, they needed to set goals, be uh, looking at approaches that would give them a solution and also time management. 
And then in terms of interpersonal skills, uh, ethics, ethical awareness, knowing what codes of conduct were, some sort of business acumen, risk management, and then understanding cultures and cultural interactions and differences in cultures and difference in people's emotional abilities and learning styles and also being aware that there are implicit biases amongst people. They thought leadership or leadership training was important and also career awareness that people knew what careers were out there and knew how to write a resume and prepare for an interview and things like that. And I thought that was something that a lot of uh, institutions do not do. And then global perspective and understanding societal uh, relevance of what they're actually doing. Next. So effective ways of developing these skills and competencies and also getting students to learn these concepts, uh, they felt experiential learning, although that's not necessarily the word they used, was the thing that was really critical. And they, it, several of the groups specifically said that faculty needed to be incentivized to increase the use of that. Um, basically, that students have constantly have opportunities to practice and use the concepts. Uh, Project-based courses were discussed as something where the whole course is around some sort of project. Uh, collaborative, integrated pro team projects, interdisciplinary projects. They also strongly stressed field work and field experiences. Uh, having the uh, problems that students or exercises students use in classes be things that use real data as opposed to ones where there's a clear answer. Um, and in fact, they stressed it's best if people are working on ones where there isn't a right answer because you don't know what the answer to the problem is yet. They stressed internships. The academics said, well, also REUs would be helpful. Um, and as many as the students could have, the better. Research experiences and projects, senior theses, uh, a number of them said the ASBOG test would give uh, would be a great source for problem-oriented activities for the classroom. And much to my surprise, they talked about using games uh, to teach and reward innovation, creativity, and then integration and use of technology, visualization, simulation, modeling, and use of real data. And they also then went into great lengths about what ways uh, academics and uh, employers could work together for some of these things, everything from them providing data sets and helping with it, and how that would have to be you know, distributed locally, industries in the areas of which the students uh, were going to school. Now, of the things that I've just listed here, uh, the survey has also collected a tremendous amount of data in terms of what actually people are doing. Uh, and what things people are trying, and that is something that we will um, be, we've tabulated and I didn't put it in today because I wanted time for questions. Uh, next. But we will, we're having a, a summit for head, particularly for heads and chairs uh, on the future of undergraduate education. It's January 8th and through 10th. Uh, it's two and a half days at the University of Texas. Uh, registration is open. It is open to November 15th, and I do have uh, some travel support available. If you're interested in signing up, uh, here's the website. You can also just go to UT's, uh, to the Jackson School's homepage, and there's something that says Geoscience and Education. You click on it, it will take you right there. Uh, we will be presenting all this other information at that meeting as well. The reason for the Heads and Chairs Summit is, is multiple. Uh, one, obviously, is discuss the results that we've gotten from the first summit, the survey, and also from the employer's workshop, but really to look at what are the effective ways of developing these kinds of skills, competencies, and conceptual understandings. What are people doing that is successful? How have they been doing it? And then how do you implement this into different curriculums? We all have very different curriculums. Some are traditional, some are not. Uh, we teach different kinds of courses. But it was really felt by everybody that we have uh, communicated with that it's very possible 
to weave these different skills and competencies and concepts into almost any curriculum. And if we can do that across the country, that will make a big difference in terms of our, all of our students being prepared for the future. The uh, summit, original summit and the survey also talked a great deal about uh, retaining recruiting underrepresented groups in science teacher preparation, and then that is also something that will be discussed at the summit. Uh, next. I'm also holding a town meeting at GSA and I will be presenting some of this other information as well and uh, I guess I've got a talk at GSA and also one at AGU that cover um, different aspects of this project and everything we have is uh, linked. These slides will be linked also on our web page and people can always contact me. Next. And I have an organizing committee for this project and it's a great diversity between you know, large schools, intermediate schools, two-year colleges, and one uh, industry representative. Next. And I just want to leave you before questions with the, the idea that if we really want to make a sustained change in geoscience education, we're all going to have to work together on this. It's going to really take uh, departments and programs across the country, administrators, individual faculty, employers, and uh, the geoscience professional societies working together to do this because we really have to make a cultural change from the administration down to the student level. And that's another thing that we'll talk about at the Heads and Chairs Summit is how you do this because it's not necessarily easy and depending on your upper administration, it's sometimes easier and sometimes it's much more difficult. But it's heads and chairs that are going to have to work with their faculty to implement these kinds of things if we're going to move forward. Uh, thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, we do have a couple questions that have come in uh, during your talk. Um, one is, you know, in the survey results uh, that you have, you know, most of the categories actually have some, you know, people that selected not important. And the question is, were those actual just skipped responses or did there were there actually people that felt any of those were not important? And if so, do you have yes, a sense were, for why? Yes, there were people who uh, picked not important. And I know exactly why, because pretty much every single one uh, said why. Um, and obviously there weren't very many for most of those and uh, it's, it, I mean, each one, it, it actually, each, you know, person who picked that and which one uh, varied greatly. Um, you got everything from people who thought that, for example, going out in the field and doing field work was, you know, obsolete. Uh, to people who felt that um, you know students you know didn't need to learn to you know work with uh, big data and to you know do simulation and things like that 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 was was totally unnecessary and so you know and sometimes you've got people who said well this is something that I think is at the graduate level or this is something they will learn when they get out or uh, occasionally I even got on some of those things is, well, this is something that they learn in other courses. They don't need to learn them in the geosciences. And so it, it, it varies. And I actually have gone through uh, all of these things and a whole lot of other the questions and looked at the responses from all the people who said no to something or said not important. And it, it varies. I mean, and it's, uh, it's all over the place. Um, there's no, I couldn't categorize that. Uh, very well. In terms of some of the other questions, such as uh, using different, you know, well, how how likely is it that your uh, department would uh, try to work these into the um, curriculum? A lot of times when people said no, it was, well, we already did, or we think we are doing that. Uh, and so you, you really have to kind of sort out sometimes why the no's are there. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, that's good. Um, another question, uh, and all the discussion of math skills that employers have uh, have asked, uh, calculus is never really brought up. So is that 
still viewed as a required class? Uh, it was they were talking about things past calculus. It was assumed that calculus would be in order to take differential equations in linear algebra. Well, certainly differential equations you have to have calculus, but yes. Yeah, so that wasn't stated, but it was yes, a definite. Okay. They wanted more. Right. Um, so another question. Uh, it, thought this was really comprehensive on the earth sciences. Is there any uh, plans to expand this into the atmospheric sciences as well? Uh, I don't have any plans to do that. The times that I've had atmospheric scientists or ocean scientists uh, involved, um, and we certainly had them at the employer's workshop, unquestionably, uh, they seem to think that most of these things you know, went across the board. Uh, perhaps more concepts, but certainly not the skills and competencies seem to be something that they you know, seem to agree uh -huh. uh, were important, but I'm sure there are more um, concepts that would be needed. Okay. Um, it would be a good thing for somebody else to do. <laughs> <laughs> Did you collect uh, demographics on uh, respond? You know, on the various respondees related to their terminal degree and age and gender and type of industry and things like that? Uh, we have it in terms of gender, type of industry. Uh, uh, what level if they were in academia you know what level they were at what, what type of school they were at um, I'd say more than half the people gave us their email and so a lot of times when I would get an answer if they you know if it was, it was particularly government you know there were a lot of people who would say government and I would get an answer and go that's interesting and I'd go over and I'd see okay you know what industry were they in by their email Mm -hmm. uh, itself. Um, but yeah, we've got a lot of uh, demographic data tied to all of these. Okay. And, and, and so then I guess the follow up question that came in is uh, would you agree with the state, the observation that there may actually be some industry disconnect with modern approaches in the geoscience education? Actually, I don't think so. I think the thing that really surprised me was how strongly the, in particularly when we had the geoscience employers, when we had them talk first about what they thought, and then this is, uh, and then showed them the summaries uh, from the summit and also the employer. I, I'm sorry, the sum, the survey data, that there was so much overlap. It was really amazing, and then when they start talking about, well, how do you, how do you get these students to do these things, to understand these things, and have these skills? They were all focused on this experiential learning and using real data and real exercises, and and all of those things really fit very well with more the modern pedagogy. Now, I will say that in reading some of the responses from some of the people who took the survey that were in industry, they they definitely showed uh, uh, less understanding or interest in it, but certainly the employers workshop, and I've done two focus groups with actually people from the um, energy industry, you know, probably two focus groups of about 50, and they all have this same view of what students need to have in terms of you know, skills and how to get those skills. And they fit with the new teaching method. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding, perhaps, about what the new teaching methods actually, and they're not new. <laughs> um, what the more modern teaching methods actually uh, do it for the people who, uh, from industry, who don't think that those are the way to go. But I don't think that's very many people, based on the data I've got. Okay. So, you know, looking at that portfolio of, of sort of target skills and, and concepts and everything, I mean, it's a pretty rigorous fundamental geoscience uh, curriculum that, that, that the employers seem to be really looking for. The, you know, but yet there's also pressure to try to get as many students in the, in, in, in the seats and departments, you know, anyone that might be struggling with enrollments. 
you know, do you see a conflict there? Or do you see this as an opportunity, um, you know, to, uh, you know, to help keep stable enrollments and in, 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 in a stronger department? <laughs> I think it's both a conflict and an opportunity. Um, it's definitely a, a conflict, and I know my own department here has talked about it. Is if if you really make it as rigorous as the employers want it to be, you will have fewer students, perhaps at least a well, at least at first. But on the other hand, you will most likely start getting a different kind of student. Uh, you'll be getting more students who maybe traditionally would have been going into engineering or uh, you know, physics or you know, more rigorous disciplines. And you won't be, get, if you require these things, you're not going to be getting the students who are taking it because they think it's an easy or easier science. And so I do think it's a conflict, but I also think it's an opportunity. Um, one of the uh, things that I know in the working group I had at the employer's workshop, somebody said something about, well, most of these kids just think they're going to be geotechs. And everybody laughed and said, yes, but geotechs need these, these uh, you know, math skills and uh, you know, computational skills. And so... I think it's something that, that we as a geoscientist really have to grapple with. Our students, when they get out, if they stay in the geoscientists, are going to need these things. And we have to find a way of, of making that work. And I don't think that's necessarily easy. Okay. So we actually have... Uh, and that's something I hope that will be discussed at the Heads and Chairs uh, workshop. And the other thing is... You know, how do you integrate little bits of math in some of the really entry courses when the students haven't or are still just taking calculus? And then how do you work in even more as they get to higher levels? But showing, and that came up in the discussion of you know, K-12 teachers, is particularly high school teachers, even if they didn't do the geosciences, when they take geosciences as an intro course, they need to see examples of things that they could use when they're teaching math or teaching physics that are geoscience examples. And if we don't use any math in our lower level courses, they aren't or any physics, they aren't going to see that. And so it it's gonna to my mind, it's gonna take some work to figure out ways to integrate more and more math into these courses when the students we know are not going to at least certainly in Texas, they're not going to come in with the kind of background that's needed to jump into these, you know, higher level um, math intensive courses. Okay, so I mean, and one of the questions was actually, you know, I think right in on what you're talking about is, you know, during the course of these these couple summits, were there any real specific, you know, uh, discussions about, you know, ways to implement, you know, this kind of mathematics coursework into it? Because, you know, there's negative pressure the other direction to to lighten the math, so. You know, were there any specific ideas and and and, and suggestions or, or success examples that came out? No, and and part of it is the summit itself, which happened what January of 2014. This need for the more quantitative skills really didn't come out. I mean, it was in there as things that we said, you know, you, you, there are. It's listed in terms of skills, but not quite the uh, intensity of what people wanted. Didn't really come out until this May when we had the employer's workshop. And so I think that's one thing that will really need to be discussed uh, this fall and then into the Heads and Chairs Summit. Sure. Okay. So, There's got to be ways of doing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have a couple questions from actually uh, a department chair in Saudi Arabia. Um, uh -huh. uh, so I guess part part of the question is whether or not you know SPE provides a forum for you know chairs uh, of programs, and was wondering you know if if there's a sense of more on the geology side, if 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 there's a good forum for that for this for ongoing discussion related to this, but also benchmarking you know obviously the data which 
you know, uh, AGI does, but also I think as far as, you know, coalescing a lot of this kind of data, you know, about curriculum uh, ongoing. Um, I'm not aware of any concerted efforts in the U.S. that have coordinated that, but I, I, you know, Sharon, I don't know if, if you're aware. No, I'm not aware of it. That I mean, the first place I would go if AGI is not doing it is, is to CERC, mm -hmm. uh, because they do so much in terms of undergraduate education and uh, collecting data and providing resources and such. Uh, mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't know whether anybody is doing that. Okay. And, a, uh, and another question from the gentleman is, uh, uh, for the January 8th through 10th summit, uh, is the discussion going to be uh, limited just to geoscience education in the U.S.? And do you plan international uh, participation or, or, or discussion about you know, the education on a global framework? I think, it, I, I think discussing on a global framework uh, makes sense because this, you know, I've had people at some of the town meetings in various uh, uh, venues where I've talked that are international, and they talk about exactly the same things. Uh, we had somebody at the workshop for employers that was from Canada that talked about what they'd done there. Uh, you know, AGI and GSA member and associated societies, we had people from overseas that were talking about what had happened in Great Britain. And so I think bringing it to a a global scale is a good idea and certainly if uh, he or others are interested we could arrange for um, them to be able to uh, participate you know through either video conferencing or Skype or FaceTime something like that okay. um, you would just need to contact me okay and then I guess uh, another question is, is is a concern that the Kate you know with with next generation science standards and everything and in, in, in progress that we're seeing with geoscience uh, is that an employer stakeholder group? It didn't include the K-12 employer community. Um, any senses on that that part of the community and how, how it be? No, we we did not include that part in the geoscience employer workshop because we were really trying to focus on where our undergraduates were going, but not into education. Um, we did collect a lot of data, and that is data I haven't finished analyzing yet, but a lot of data on what people are doing in terms of K through 12. And it is something that I expect to have discussed at, and what people should be doing discussed at the Heads and Chairs Summit. Okay. But we did not include them in the employers, no. Okay. There are K through 12 people, however, who have answered the survey. People teaching it in K through twelve to have answered the survey. Okay. But it's a fairly small amount. Interesting. So another question, uh, I think this is from another participant uh, outside the US. Uh, was there any sense from the discussion of employers that international students, do they need to actually have a, a superset of these skills uh, um, to actually get a you know find employment uh, coming out, you know, being an, inter being an international graduate is at a disadvantage. So coming out and working in the U.S. or working in their own country or globally? I think, you know? I, I think, uh, I think just probably in the U.S. I think that's the context. Okay. I, I have a feeling that if the students internationally had the skills and the concepts that have been outlined that they, if they just had them, they would not have difficulties. They wouldn't need to have a superset. Uh, I think there are, I mean, the skills and and concepts that they're wanting students to understand. I mean, I think that that transcends uh, globally, and I don't think they need to have more. I don't think it would be necessary. Okay, so it's it's really just more of a visa work rights issue kind of thing then. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, let's see. So another question is, uh, you know, any sense about how we as a community could have, you know, a one pager that a department chair could take to deans and provosts to, you know, try to facilitate implementation of curricular change? I mean, is that a goal? I think we could do that. I think that would be a good goal. 
it would be something uh, that we could definitely do. It's something that I think would come out of the the summit for the heads and chairs. Okay. So those are all of the typed questions. So I guess if anyone else has some more questions or want to raise their hand, I can try to unmute you. Uh, we still have about six minutes left on our time slot. Uh, I will tell you, uh, Sharon, we're getting, there's many kudos coming in for an excellent presentation and your leadership on this issue. So uh, I think the community is very, very appreciative of all your all your work in uh, trying to push forward the future of Chief Well, Biden. thank you. So I will give it one more minute in case folks are trying to type out a question. <laughs> Well, while we're waiting, I would encourage uh, people to, you know, come uh, either to the GSA town meeting or if you can come to the summit, it would be great to get your input. <laughs>